It's, I mean, it's kind of the point, isn't it? So it's a video live stream. Yes. But you can't see me, so. Nope. I sure can't. I sure can't. I can't see you. Unless I, like, glance <laughs> down to my laptop right over here. And that'll it. be about, I don't know, 20 seconds behind? Yeah, thereabouts. So it's why I'm now moving to the left uh, just a little bit with that there. But hey, everybody. How you doing this evening or morning, wherever you may happen to be, or maybe even the afternoon if you're really far along, uh, <laughs> close to the international dateline for all I know. Uh, we, our viewers are from everywhere, and we're very glad to have you all watching tomorrow today, or tonight, or tomorrow tomorrow, perhaps, uh, depending upon where you are. I'm Jared. That's I'm Jared. I really like my microphone extra close to me, and that's Ryan over there. <laughs> she can see we're absolute professionals at this. And yep. and I don't know if I can get a camera to cut into the area, but guess who's here? That's right. Who's that? Hi. Hey, look who is in studio. I'm back. Yes. He's bad. I just, just, I just realized I banged my microphone. I apologize if that was apparently loud. Yeah, Dada, you are back. Everybody's saying hi to Dada in the chat room. It's so glad to have you back. Um, yep, a wild Dada has appeared. Uh, Daddy's home, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> He's told why you do not sound so happy there for a second. Uh, so Maddie says, wait, Dada was missing. Yes, uh, Dada was missing. I was... <laughs> operating the show literally with this thing called a stream deck next to me and you couldn't see anything nope, i couldn't <laughs> um so that's why things have been a bit choppy for the start of the year but now dad is here dad are you allowed to say why you weren't here i, I was he was lost in the baggage system at gatwick airport that's why. <laughs> <laughs> among many other things yes i i went to uh to cornwall to try to launch a rocket oh okay and, um and and we i did my part Okay, that's good. That's a, that's a <laughs> good way of putting it. Um, did were did they, did the colony? Did they did the British like lock you up from being from the colonies or something or what went on? Uh, no, they were they were super supportive. Um, everybody was great. It's just that pesky little second stage getting into orbit. Excellent. Yeah, that it's it's rocketry, folks. So and uh, Sakura's so Light just became a member. Thank you so much for becoming a member of tomorrow. And of course, if you would like to become a member, you can head on over to youtubecom tmro join We have a multitude of different levels of membership. But one of the cool things you get to watch the members only stream, which we do immediately after the show. So if you'd like to see us sort of messing around, talking in a little bit more detail about things and just essentially goofing off um, and maybe drinking the unbelievably expensive alcohol that's currently <laughs> here at Station 204 that Jamie is entrusting me to not consume. <laughs> um, you could d definitely jump in on <laughs> that. And then Jay everybody's saying, hey, James is celebrating 13 months of membership, all worth it. That's very, uh, very Chris Radcliffe of you. Tomorrow, it's worth it. So, um, I mean, it's true. It's true. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, and of course, Jason, you know, remember to hit the like, subscribe, ring the bell, and everything. Yep, do it, do it all. And apparently, uh, Sakura's Light says that you have a Psyche t shirt on, Ryan. Is I, that true? I do indeed. You oh. can't see it, but wow. I do. Yes, you do. Yeah, yeah, I and do. you know, it's, yeah. it's 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 really great because look at this. I've got a JPL shirt on. See, and who, who's Who's helping manage Psyche? JPL. It's almost like we we planned this. Yay. But we didn't. Yeah. That's that's really no. weird. Um. So we have got. A it's almost like we're both space nerds. Possibly. I don't know. I, I'm the jury's still out on me. Um. So we have got a lot to talk about this week. I mean, like we have got a lot to talk about so ryan why don't i hand it to you first because you've i would say the top two this week are most certainly you um in terms of the the knowledge base with it so why don't i hand it off to you and you can pick whichever of those two you would like to go with um well i've got one so i don't know what the other one is but i mean i kind of named the stream something to do with nuclear propulsion mm -hmm. nasa getting involved and for the first time in YouTube history, it isn't clickbait. 
yes, as we were uh, telling everybody uh, earlier, yes, it's n this is not clickbait. Our stream is not clickbait. There is actual... 100%. That's a tomorrow promise. Yep. It's like, like when you go to the over. shop and it has like a, like a, like a, um, what do you call it? What's the, what's the, like a, I'm trying, like an organic promise thing, right? This is oh, like a tomorrow okay. promise. Yeah. So it's legit, not clickbait. Certified it's, organic. Yeah. It's like when McDonald's was like, I think, what was it like 20 years ago when they were like McNuggets now finally a hundred percent real chicken. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we won't tell you what it was before. No. What were they? Mystery. Um, but yes, very, very exciting. Tell us some of the deets about it. So essentially, to make nuclear propulsion very simple, because it's quite complicated, <laughs> in the past, there have been tests from the United States of a nuclear engine, the NERVA program, I think is how it's referred, but yes. those were all on the ground. This new program, however, working at NASA, are going to be working with DARPA, which stands for Defense Something or Other, an engine agency, I think. Defense Advanced They're Research going to Projects Agency. Thanks, Jared. You're welcome. They're gonna they're gonna do this, but in space. So they're actually gonna test a rocket engine, a nuclear propulsion rocket engine, in the place it's meant to be used, which is very exciting because when done right, nuclear propulsion can be so efficient and go really far places on not a lot of years. So yeah, it's very exciting for a very uh, how do I say this? not pessimistically for missions that are in the future that want to go very 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 far places this is this is going to be very useful technology yeah and fantastic to hear that finally the push f to start testing nuclear technology again has finally paid off um mm -hmm. because everybody hears the word nuclear and they get a little sort of skittish about it but the safety of it is pretty high up there uh yeah. a, a lot of the problems that have occurred with with systems involving nuclear accidents it's just i think the biggest thing with it is like when you the the biggest news stories around nuclear technology are the big things that go wrong like the big station explosions and whatnot and it's like oh it's going all over europe it's going all over asia it's going to injure so many people but the the benefits of nuclear it very much outweigh the, the the negative news stories that it that it has a reputation for. Yeah, and quite a few of the accidents too are essentially operator error in involving mm -hmm. it as well, or uh, with that. So, um, yeah, this is this is really really exciting because this was something that was thought about a very long time ago, and and it's almost like one of those things like, oh man, what if we had continued down this road and just developed it and sort of had like this whole fleet? I mean, the idea was to have a mm -hmm. fleet of nuclear space tugs working with a a fleet of space shuttle orbiters in the seventies, um, but that's not what ended up happening <laughs> um, with that there. Uh, so, and Marty the Martian saying, I blame Homer Simpson um, <laughs> with that. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> I like Philip here, which is Wind Project Orion. Oh my gosh, that's such a... <laughs> 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 oh, it's such good stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just so cool that we're finally yeah. getting this technology up and going with it. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that they're going to do, they're going to put it, uh, well, I guess the best way to say it right now is that because it is still many years away, there's not been mm -hmm. much in terms of like, what is the spacecraft going to do um, with it? There are some things that they've been talking about that they're going to do with it. Like they want to have a baseline altitude of 700 kilometers. They think they might try to push it to 2000 kilometers at times when testing it. Um, but overall, they're just looking to have as as best and simplified a demonstration as possible with a nuclear thermal mm -hmm. rocket. Um, so yeah, very exciting uh, that they're doing that. Quest oh, question. Yes. Are they going to try to use this technology to get into orbit or is this just for once you're in orbit to get very far away? This would likely, I would imagine, Ryan, it's probably in orbit and get very far away. Uh let me let me read it i'll get back to Ooh, it. I yeah stumped him. okay so i think if we're t i think if they're talking about moving orbits from 700 to 2000 kilometers then this would be some sort of an upper stage in use at that as to whether it's a th second stage or a third stage um that would be with it um 
So, uh, and then Apollo has a good question here, which is what happens if it ruds or... Well, my answer is actually a bit involved in this because oh, the, the agreement so far for the demonstration mission hasn't really... That what's actually happening, to answer Dutta's question, hasn't really been outlined. However, um, uh, Pam Elroy has said that the altitude of 700 kilometers potentially up to 2000 kilometers that is the altitude in place so that if anything does go wrong and for re-entry the nuclear materials will not be as uh what's the word radioactive and safer for humans on earth yeah, so essentially the radioactive materials will go through their half-life and turn into the daughter mm-hmm. products much That's faster. What, I was looking for half-life, but I couldn't think of half-life. Yeah, it's all good. Um, but I do want to point out something with this nuclear rocket, which is that it is DARPA that is working on this project with NASA. Um, mm-hmm. And it's very important to realize that DARPA is not necessarily an agency that is looking to finish projects. It is an agency that is looking to essentially say, can we do this? Um, So there Mm -hmm. have been a multitude of spaceflight projects that DARPA has been involved in that have never made it to fruition. Um, one of them I could think of right off hand is the XS-1, where they were going to have uh, building a reusable uh, space plane booster um, with that there. And that just reached a point where DARPA, and I believe it was Boeing, um, where they were working together um, on that, and uh, they basically just said, no, this doesn't look like it's actually economically feasible (laughs) with the configuration that is wanted, uh, so we're going to end the program, and that happened immediately back in January of 2020. So DARPA's very very much living up... um, living up to that 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 research portion of its name you know because its full name is defense yeah. advanced research projects agency yes i was reading that um so <laughs> research big part of its name so they are working on a nuclear rocket it's really important it is a technology that will enable us to get from places like earth to mars faster and frankly um as myself, someone who's also interested in robotic space flight, you should be able to get to other places faster too. Um, not just Mars with people, um, send probes further out faster without having to do gravitational assists, which is very helpful. Um, but the key point here is that it's, it is DARPA research that does not necessarily equal hardware or, or program or actually flown into space. So, I don't want to say like temper expectations, but just it's like a like a feasibility study. Exactly. Yeah, but a very deep diving feasibility study in this case. So very excited um, about it. So yeah, and then uh, Stephen Goose saying Alpha Centauri. Yeah, you know I don't think a nuclear thermal rocket um, would be able to pull that off. So it might take uh, might take a little bit more than yes. that. Um, uh <laughs> with that there so uh there was the uh also the pulse detonation um engine as well right that was just tested um i don't have any footage of it right the rotating yeah, pulse detonation me neither. I, let me but they were able to successfully this is another thing i'm gonna have to look at <laughs> yeah they're gonna ha- they actually did successfully fire it for a, a a expected duration um with it so it is something um and rat king in here had a great one which was pulse detonation nuclear thermal engine fun um yeah that should be uh should be a really really good time uh and actually jason or oh excuse me philip uh white house uh very good correction here rotating detonation rocket engine thank you so much um for that there and then jason bringing up a really good thing which is funny thing how humanity's electricity generation history is the history of humans boiling water <laughs> <laughs> we've always been obsessed with fire it's just how have we made it and then what have we used it for so mm-hmm. we're just we're just a bunch we just like fire. And can we make fire look even cooler yeah exactly can we can we do we need 
uh, sparks to make the fire? Can we use a liquid to make the fire? Why have liquids? We could have solids to make the fire. So, yeah, <laughs> just a general history of that. So, good times. Yeah, and then, oh, John, making the good puns as always, the Nerva it. <sighs> very, very nice. So, <laughs> did you have anything on that uh, for us, Ryan? No, I, I, I have looked. I can't see if I can... I can't, I can't see if I can find any footage. That's not English. I can't find any footage. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I'm probably looking in the wrong place. But yeah. 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 Well, that's all right. It's it's all good uh, with that there. So, um, yeah. So, nuclear engine, not clickbait. We're act some, somebody's actually doing it. Mm -hmm. See if it goes all the way. <laughs> I guess is the way to say it. I hope it, it does. Me That'd too. That'd be awesome for it to go all the way. But, yeah. You know. Yeah, and I think um, yeah. a really good thing to point out here: why is a nuclear why is a nuclear thermal rocket such a important thing? Well, it increases the efficiency of a rocket. It can do that almost. It can almost double um, what we call the specific impulse, or the measurement of the amount of mm -hmm. energy you can get out of a certain amount of propellant. Um, and when you can double that, oh man, that is a huge amount. Yeah. Uh, with that, there, I've seen some. Nuclear thermal rockets uh, speculated to be up to a thousand seconds of specific impulse, which is a lot. That would be um, some, of, at least in terms of non-electric engines, um, like ion engines, electric engines. Yeah, you can have them in rockets. Sorry, Twitter. Um, the, you, <laughs> with that there, they're not at that point. They're an order of magnitude less, but they're still significantly more significantly more efficiency out of it than a regular liquid propellant engine like we like we use right now so it would be the same propellants um but you could just get more efficiency out of it with it there so really fun stuff man i hope they make it happen um i don't know if i would go to that launch i might watch that one from home um <laughs> but i definitely your, would be rooting for it from your fallout shelter <laughs> yeah wherever that is <laughs> so <laughs> there's and eka says that uh they've heard up to near 2000 isp but that will take much tuning and considering the maximum we've got so far in human history is about 400 isp that is a monumental improvement in efficiency of a rocket engine yeah and um I, you know, I was just thinking about some of the things. Uh, is it cl chlorine penta or uh, chlorine pentafluoride that they add, or chlorine? Yeah, chlorine pentafluoride that they add that they add to some types of rocket fuel to increase it. I've also seen some that are like laced with boron and other stuff, <laughs> other really nasty stuff that you just don't want to be near. Um, that would increase it. Um, someone in the chat room will s absolutely be able um, to do it. So, or t to tell us um, what I'm looking for. I can't. I just cannot recall. It's been a while since I've read Ignition. Oh, but yeah. There, there are some nasty, nasty propellants. Oh, my God, but that boy, are really, really good. Yeah, that's the problem. I. I'm talking about one specifically that um, he mentions in ignition that he says is reactive with everything, uh, concrete, water, air, test engineers uh, inside of the <laughs> container with it. It's one of those things where they actually have to coat the inside of the container with a layer of the liquid so that way it doesn't actually react with the container that it's put in. It's it's some of the... Uh, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, hold on. A, yeah, Apollo says it seems all the bad ones are the orange fuels. Yes. So that's why my favorite color is orange. And then uh, Philip Whitehouse, basically verbatim pu putting it here. And I'm going to go through it because it's just great. Um, which is chlor chlorine trifluoride is, of course, extremely toxic. But that's the least of the problem. It burns rapidly with every known fuel and no delay in ignition has ever been measured. That's scary. Uh, it also burns with things such as cloth, wood, asbestos, sand, water, and not to mention human beings. And did I mention that when added to water, it produces hydrochloric and hydrofluoric acid? For dealing with this chemical, I always recommend a good pair of running <laughs> shoes. <laughs> Yikes. Holy moly. Um, but 
if you really want to have a incredibly efficient hydrolox rocket throw in a little chlorine trifluoride nothing wrong with that <laughs> or uh get the pentafluoride that's got uh, two more fluorines in it in it too Woo, that's the good stuff. chlorine trifluoride so. when it absolutely must burn <laughs> yeah that's pretty good or if we want to get like really like good pr department with it when it absolutely must combust yeah so trademark that one or something that we can put that on a shirt uh for it there so yeah so nuclear thermal rockets finally so you know we, can, we uh, maybe we actually can title this show game over nasa <laughs> announces <laughs> nuclear <laughs> rocket so not clickbait no it's not um and there's no bitcoin to be found here um let's, let's wait till darpa <laughs> says that they can actually do it <laughs> well the thing is they may, that we may not know um we need the views that. now yeah not in 20 years we need, the, makes, news, we need the views that makes now. it clickbait ryan dada we need the views to buy chlorine trifluoride who, who am i <laughs> but your voice of reason true so yeah yeah <laughs> robin baron there <laughs> Who knew that energetic propellants are energetic chemicals? Not me. Not me. Oh, my gosh. I never would have made that connection. You guys are really starting to get bad here. Jason saying, oh, my God, nuclear fluorine rocket. 5,000 mm. seconds to, of ISP. No, no, no. Stop that. Stop that. All of you right now, stop it. So you're, you're all a very bad influence. So... Uh, there was also something happening in Texas, I, too, I, right? I, I am going to say that it, that it is only a rocket engine if you can control the explosion. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, Otherwise, it's just an explosion. Yeah. Well, what's the saying? You're you're a uh, rocket engineer as it's working, and then when it blows up, and you have to figure out why you're finally a rocket scientist. Yes. So, so I guess by that measure, there are two here. So maybe I don't know. Uh, so. Did want to talk a little bit about Texas uh, because there has been some stuff going on down in Texas, some minor stuff with a small company with a big, moderately sized rocket or something. I don't know. So yeah, there's a there's a little bit of a wet dress rehearsal on Monday. Not that big of a deal. Just the last big remaining step before the first orbital launch of Starship. It's just which two is weeks exciting. out. It's just two weeks out. Just two weeks two out. Weeks. Just two weeks. So. Two weeks is fine. So, yeah, that was ve that was very exciting to see go what appears successfully. The SpaceX said on Twitter that it went well, so I guess that means it was successful. Yeah. Ship 24 has now been uh, relegated to the Rocket Garden, which is SpaceX's little um, scrap heap car park, basically, for starships that they, that they, well, normally, that they don't want anymore, don't have a use for anymore. But the suspicion is that they've run out of space at the production site, and they needed to put Ship Twenty Four somewhere. So they've just left it on the, literally left it on the side of the road for now, and they'll be bringing it in later to get rid of the uh, crane attachment points that are on top, and then sort out the rest of the thermal protection tiles that are definitely not falling off. And then Booster Seven, without the ship on top, will do a thirty-three engine static fire with no flame trench. Because that will go well. Oh. And then Ship 24 will go back to the pad. Ship 24 will go on top. And then they'll launch because everything will go perfectly swimmingly like it does on every first test flight of a rocket ever. Oh, man, I am not looking forward to the person who's going to have to sit down in that meeting and, and look someone in the eyes and say, flame trench. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna have we're gonna have to see if the big water spray thing that they put in there is going to actually dampen the acoustical energy. Well, it's suspected. I think it, it, I I don't know if it's been confirmed or not, but I at least it's at least heavily suspected that that's not they. It's not suppression. It's fire deluge stuff in case of explosion, not in case of launch. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Philip, a, Philip says small D mister. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it gets it's rather what it is. It's uh, mist. I mean, it gets hot <laughs> down in Texas. So, and you want to cool off any way you can. And that's like a, yeah. a good way to do it. Um, 
oh man, I'm just really nervous about this. I mean, as I am with every rocket on its first flight, right? Like I was, if you go back <laughs> and you watch the Tomorrow episodes, you know, the, the uh, uh, last quarter of 2017 into 2018, uh, you'll you'll see me being very nervous about Falcon Heavy um, and <laughs> things like that. So I'm just really hoping that things go well. Um, obviously, we all want things to go well um, with it. We all love a perfect flight right out of the gate, but it's very mm-hmm. rare for a test flight to actually, you know, work out all that well uh, from for its first one. So... We're going to have to see, Um, although this one really does, (sighs) yeah, there's so many unknowns involved in this um, Mm -hmm. that it's, it's, yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's going to be a good one. Yeah. Fingers crossed it goes well. Yeah. And Jack Fisher uh, really obviously bringing up a good point, uh, which is they won't know if they really need a flame trench unless they try it without. Um, Yeah, that's true. Um, Usually in in the design work, we want to know before, but also if you find out after, that's a way to do it too. Um, Actually, I like Steven's suggestion here, uh, which is, will a crater work as a trench so if there's a big crater, i'm not sure because a crater is a bit more circular than a trench a trench is a big long straight hole basically a big long straight cutting crater is more of a a, a circular shape in the ground so i'm not sure uh philip whitehouse says that, that uh the water table at Boca Chica is high enough that any crater will become a water pond um so maybe it won't be maybe that's what spacex have been planning all along i just haven't been able to fire up 33 engines at once so i, I don't know you never know yeah the master plan of elon musk yeah it's it is in the aether far beyond the understanding of us mere mortals um apparently but i do want to say that that if you do make a really big if it does make a really big crater oh man um that's not going to be great i also i would say i was today years old when i found out uh that there are actually there actually is a crater from one of the n1 rockets that failed to, mm-hmm. to lift off i i was unaware of this and for those of you that don't know what the n1 is that was the soviet union's rocket to send uh their crewed missions to the moon that just never worked correctly um but yeah, yeah there's at baikonur there is still a massive crater like a 40 meter crater <laughs> from when one of them smashed into the ground. I mean, that's the whole point of Baikonur existing. It's in the middle of nowhere. Nobody mm-hmm. lives there for miles and miles. If they leave a big hole in the ground, there's not really a local council to complain about it. So, what <laughs> what are they going to do? It's just, oh, we made a big hole. Oopsie poopsies. Let's move on and make some Soyuz rockets instead. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Dada. Uh, showing the N1 rocket there. Absolute unit. It is the most Kerbal of all rockets to ever fly in the real world. Yeah. That it's the, the prestigious title held by the N1. Yep. And the Soviet engineers, who are long gone now, will never know that it holds such a prestigious title to this day. Yes. Owen. They're, f- they're standing right there. You can see them. Yes. Owen 4, by the way, <laughs> if you're wondering, <laughs> which is a very baseball kind of way of describing it. Uh, and actually, Smokey, good to, good to see you, Smokey, uh, has brought up the. Uh, Latin longitude of it. So if we want to flash that on the screen real quick, everybody jump onto Google. Uh, you Get can't, your notepads out, write it down. Yeah, Be I was quick. about to say, you cannot copy that uh, on your screen, no. <laughs> but feel free to write it I mean, it it's down. in chat, so you can try copy it that way. Can you do that? I don't know. I think you can. So... But you know, Depends, it's yeah. it's pretty it's pretty entertaining, um, to say the least, with, with, with all of that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I'm I I am going to be you know paying attention very closely when that flight happens, um, but mm-hmm. I'm also like really concerned about the whole testing regime coming up because there's just so many unknowns, stuff that nobody's really ever done before, um, no. and then also there's very difficult things too um, that are still coming up like. You know the, uh, you know. It's got the Google Maps up. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Dada. Take a look at that. So there's actually are those all craters there? Just all different things that they've blown up. Well, I mean, you know, if you're gonna do it, 
I mean, so. it's in the middle of nowhere, so why not? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you're going to leave a giant hole there, then what's the point? It's like when the US government was blowing up bombs in Nevada. It's like, well, no one lives there. Who cares? Let's just leave a big hole in the ground. Well, people live downwind. We kind of forgot about that a little bit. So. Yeah, but um, they don't live there. Oops. So uh, do, they, do they live in the hole? No, not my problem. <laughs> It ended up becoming a problem, Ryan. So <laughs> that that was actually the official position of the U.S. government. Turns out, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, still is in some cases uh, with things. So yeah, um, yeah. What? So I would imagine the upcoming things. We've got a thirty-three engine. Uh, uh, oh my gosh, there went my brain. Otto has an image. I think this is the crater, and oh, it's got some. Wow metal that looks very old in the middle of it whoa so yeah holy moly there's two guys standing there so it, that stuff that is way too small to be n1 crater or n1 wow. debris wow that is uh impressive <whistles> that's a cool crater though yeah it's a nice one okay so. right let's stop getting distracted starship yeah. starship starship Sorry. starship uh, so we got the 30 rocket 33 engine static fire to work through um what else yep. have we got to work through before orbital launch um that's into if, if for the bare minimum of what spacex would need to do that's pretty much it 33 engine static fire make sure the booster works put s24 back on top shoot off to hawaii the long way around however <laughs> if things do not go to plan and the vehicle is still intact following that static fire they'll obviously want to do it again well i hope they'd want to do it again when they put ship 24 on they may want to do another wet dress rehearsal to ensure everything still works they haven't broken anything like yeah. they did with booster seven's transfer tube uh, <laughs> a very frosty rocket uh so they may want to do another wet dress once the booster has been certified that it can run 33 of pretty much the most efficient most powerful rocket engines ever built so yeah it might not be in two weeks i'm afraid to say but if everything continues to be as successful as we hope it has been so far, a launch in the first quarter or second quarter of this year actually seems feasible, which is a very strange thing to say, considering that's what Elon Musk also said. And historically, Elon time has been extremely, extremely ahead of Earth time. Yeah, moving a little bit uh, faster there. So we'll have to see if that's uh, what actually ends up happening. Uh, David Boddington has a, <laughs> has a really good um, suggestion here that I actually like, which is what about we do a 33 engine test with Ship 24 atop to find out how many tiles are going to fall off um, on launch. Well, and the interesting thing about that is, especially back when the static fires with the older ships, when they first started putting the TPS tiles on, the vibrations felt in the rocket during a static fire are much worse than mm -hmm. when it's actually flying. At least that's what I've been told. Yes. So, when it's flying through the air with 33 Raptors powering it, the vibrations are not going to be as bad as if they did the 33 engine static fire with the ship on top. It would be more damaging to do that with the ship on top on the ground than to fly with it on top anyways. So that's why that's not in the whole plan because they'll just damage the ship if they try to do that because the moment that the engines are ignited and then the thing flies straight off the launch mount so that short amount of time is considered all right i guess if not they wouldn't be able to launch so that's, you, a, that's my guesstimate i feel like there might be a way to dampen the energy that's being you know le imparted you know around the early you know couple seconds of launch but i just the name of such a device just keeps slipping my mind um this mm, is what it could yeah. be so um yeah. but my <laughs> at columbia is made in flight it had tiles fall off too yes yes it did yep. um and that and, and then they installed some sort of uh god what it was what was it called i don't remember i remember it involved <sighs> water was it a hydration uh, like a camel pack? No, I don't think so. Um, Derange? I don't. I don't remember. Derange. The, the deluge. Water deluge system. Oh, that's yeah. That's what it was. That's right. And we they put it in a. They put it in a, a. What was it? It was called a. A, a train flinch. A train flinch. Tame flinch. I don't. I don't. What was, uh, 
huh? Flame. Flame trench. Flame trench, yes. Yes, that's so, what it was. Yeah, so it was a water deluge system to dampen the acoustical energy so it would go out the flame trench in the correct direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, so Almost as if they thought about it. Yeah, yeah, with it there. It's Kurt's light saying uh, tsunami device. So, yeah, I, I don't know if it's really a... I wouldn't call it a tsunami. I'd call it like maybe like a really rainy day all of a sudden. I don't know what that would be called. <laughs> So, rain device? Like, heavy rain device. <laughs> um, yeah, anyways, my absolute nightmare is that they're going to have a camera set up um, to show the launch. Um, well, they are going to have a camera set up. Um, my absolute nightmare is that it's going to be yeah. from an angle <laughs> where you can see Ship 24, and then the 33 um, Raptors ignite, it comes off of the pad, and you just see, like, a chest pattern of... of tiles fall off of it immediately <laughs> and i'm just gonna be like oh my god so, well, it's all right if this one doesn't come back that's the whole point it's a learning process okay yeah. so you just gotta yeah it's not a big deal just yeah, it's a it's a one-way trip to hawaii that it may not survive <laughs> Bless its heart. It's all right. It, I mean, I mean, I wonder how Jamie's getting there for a birthday. You know, so totally n not. Mm, I don't mm. know. Yeah, oh, it's a strange coincidence. Is that fan? That fan is saying pieces falling off of it, like insulation <laughs> off of a Chinese rocket. That's very true. Um, and actually, I'm with Philip on this, uh, which is that if it gets anywhere near Hawaii, it'll be a big success. Um, and again, I mean, we we are we are joking around about some of these things and stuff like that, but at the same time, we all want it to work. Um, so, best of luck to him. Um, and man, I really, uh, we're going to see what's happening a little bit. Dan is, <laughs> so tickets are currently free, but you're going to have to pay a lot of in legal fees to sign off the waivers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And T-Man saying that I'm more worried about the static fire than the orbital launch. And I mean, Yeah. That's very true. Um, there's still there are still many steps to go until orbital launch, and they got to make sure um, with it there. Uh, and our avail. So so to be fair, it's it's still not an orbital launch. It's still a parabolic oh, launch. God, not this debate again. I, the the original plan was for it to be a few meters per second off orbit. I think. You and Ryan go the, at the it. The plan has been, I think the plan has now been revised for it to reach orbit and orbital velocity, but end up in Hawaii. That is what I think is the current plan from the various different government documents that have been published. So, how many orbits? It will not complete a full orbit, however it will reach orbital velocity. Then it's still better. If it didn't slow true. down, it would keep going. You can reach orbital velocity, but if you don't insert it into an orbit, it is not an orbital launch. It's still parabolic. Mm -hmm. You can exceed orbital velocity and still have a parabolic launch. Yeah, shuttle was initially launched into what would have essentially been a parabolic trajectory. So and e every, it, every it, rocket that's ever launched is a parabolic trajectory until it circularizes its orbit. Regardless of what its orbital, what its, what its final speed uh -huh. is. <laughs> I mean, when yeah. I jump, I'm on a parabolic trajectory yes. until I increase my velocity yes. to the <laughs> to the point that I can stay in orbit around the Earth. Unless so. unless you circularize, you're not in orbit. Yeah, I would agree with that. Abort. Uh, uh, I mean, abort okay. once around, we wouldn't consider that an orbital That's flight. Not a, no, it's not an orbital flight. And this is essentially an abort once around, but it's not an abort because there's no abort system on Starship. Right. So, okay. <laughs> well, well, if the thrust to weight ratio is okay, then you know, being a boss, this, uh, well, let's think about that. Mm, uh, uh, that's the official answer on that one. I gotta so. say, detonations are fast, so, <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay, uh oh, <laughs> Dada, you Zach started has a point. Our chat Zach room has a point. It is circularized, it just intercepts the earth. <laughs> and that's a good point. It, the, if the earth wasn't there, it would keep going. Mic drop. Oh, but Eka, I think, has it here, which is that fractional orbits do exist. So, that is a thing. 
Like they uh, like that is a technical term. So are they doing doing a deorbit burn? I don't know. Are they? I think it's just belly flopping. Okay. <laughs> so it's so what you're telling me is that they're imparting uh, just enough energy to ICBM it, but around the Earth. Yes. Gotcha. Essentially, <laughs> I'm not sure on that. That is what I think is going to happen. Not, but not an orbital. I presume it'll be a similar thing like it was with the shuttle that if <laughs> if the um, if they don't put if they how do I English this so it makes sense? Try it in British. They need first. to make sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> SpaceX me right now. SpaceX needs to do this flight profile to figure out how much drag they need to impose upon Starship by positioning the vehicle in specific ways in order to make sure that it lands, stroke, splashes down, stroke, crashes in the roughly correct space, roughly near Hawaii somewhere. Similar to how the shuttle had to do the rolly things like that, because if it just kept going like that, it would have enough lift to go back up, and that's not the way they needed to go. They need to go down. Sure, but that's on re-entry. That's not... Yeah, but it, it will be re-entering the atmosphere. Of Starship will, because it will be coming back. And course, it'll be of course it will, because it's a parabolic trajectory. <laughs> Got it. Thanks. <laughs> I love this comment from Aravale here, because we can agree with this, which is that it's going to crash into the ocean. The only questions are which ocean and in how many pieces. So, very well said, Aravale. Um So, anyways... Good luck to SpaceX. Uh, may they may they have an excellent flight, whatever you believe it may be. This is the engineering <laughs> equivalent of is Pluto a planet? Um, so I very much <laughs> look forward uh, to the physical fights that are going to break out at AI AA meetings, um, just like the <laughs> ones that break out at uh, American Astronomical Society meetings. So uh, should be really. Really fun. Oh, ouch. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? You saw it too. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ow. Uh, was it the Jason one? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Yeah. We're going to remember that one. <laughs> so, oh my God. The chat room is now commenting as to whether Pluto is a planet or not. We are not touching that tonight. We are. <laughs> you started a whole other thing. That is on you. Oh. That is on you and you only. Pluto is a world. There you go. You're welcome. Um. Oh. <laughs> uh, I missed it. Uh, oh, yeah. T-Man, the official channel, is asking, uh, what do you guys think the first booster catch will be? And do you think that they'll catch it on the first attempt? It depends how big Elon's ego is, I think, to be honest. <laughs> and you can make your own assumptions about that. I won't impose any opinions on, upon that. However, I think they, that Elon would want to try and get this insane idea proof-tested in the most... Quick, quick, in the quickest way possible that wouldn't result in destroying the entire facility at Boca Chica. Mm -hmm. So I think realistically, maybe the earliest, I'd probably put it down to the third flight. First flight, definitely not. Second flight, I don't think so. They'll still want the experience of trying to get a ship into a, as Dada would say, an orbit, as I would say, a bigger orbit. The third flight, I think, is when they can start focusing on the recovery of the booster. Just because of how ludicrously insane the engineering behind that is. Landing something that's 70 meters tall on a teeny pair of sticks sticking out from a tower that's plummeting back to Earth from space. It's just... Yeah. They'll, I think SpaceX will need at least two flights experience before they attempt to catch something going so fast in such a small little area on two little pins on two sticks yeah it, yeah yeah i agree uh, i think it'll be the third one because of operational considerations and things like that um i, I you know and I, I don't think they'll get it on the third one i, I i'm no. gonna be honest i don't think they'll get it on it no but i think they will try on the third uh, I think that they are going to blow up the pad in Boca Chica at some point. So 
that thing is going to be a heap of twisted metal, um, mostly laying around on the ground. Uh, whether it is from this first attempt at flight, from the static fire, for all we know, um, from a a, a, star, a uh, super heavy booster colliding with it. Um, huh. Yeah. I mean, it would be a shame, but to yeah. be honest, the Elon has said that Boca Chica is the test facility. Mm -hmm. If this was, go if the launch pad and all of the infrastructure is going to get absolutely obliterated by an exploding booster and chip, Boca Chica is the pad for that to happen. What NASA definitely doesn't want, and what SpaceX also probably don't want, is to do t test launches like that from the Starship mount to LC 39A because they lose their Falcon pad at 39A, which at the moment is their only is the United United States' only way of getting humans into space. Now, we've seen some groundwork at Slick 40 thanks to the SpaceX webcasts over the last few weeks, but that tower ain't going to be ready anytime soon, and I'm sure NASA are going to have some entire certification process to make a launch pad suitable for crew and all of that. That's not going to be ready tomorrow. SpaceX needs to make sure that they don't destroy the 39A pad, which is why that's going to happen at Boca Chica if it does happen. Yeah. Do you know if uh, SpaceX is planning to have assets in the area that if Starship uh, were to a you know, actually make it to its parabolic trajectory uh, coming off the coast of Hawaii, will they actually have assets there that will be able to see it? I mean, not uh, live, but, you know. I'm going to be honest. Not a clue. Okay. I suspect that they would. I suspect. I don't know. Is NASA going to throw a, a, a what's it? The WB fifty-seven. Thirty-seven. Yeah. Fifty-seven. Yeah. So you can tell it's what is it? Quarter to two in the morning. I I think NASA could throw one of them out. Throw one of them out there. But maybe I don't know. Jamie has said in the past that she needs to go to Hawaii and her birthday trip is coming up. Wink, wink. Ooh. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Uh. Uh, I, I don't know. That is just that is that, that is pure speculation. By the way, yes. that is nothing official. Pure speculation. Yes. We have no clue what she's up to. Yeah. Um. I would. I would be very surprised if there weren't assets all around in that expected area. I think there will be. I just don't know what will be there. Yeah. Um. Uh, as much as you can get. So. So. And there is. I will say there is a very strong Air Force presence in Collect Hawaii. It. All so, the data. Yep. Every sh every bit of data that you can have, get it all. So every uh, bit, bite, and nibble. Mm -hmm. Every 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 uh, piece that you can possibly have. Um, and Bennett's asking, will the assets be SpaceX or not? Um, who cares? Yeah, a little bit of who cares, but also I feel like they borrow, they borrow assets from NASA and the Space Force and yeah. stuff like that all the time. It's the NASA and the Space Force are as interested in Starship as SpaceX are. Maybe even more interested because think how big those spy satellites you can fit in Starship, right? So they're going to be very interested, and oh, maybe we can bring some payloads back to Earth as well. Yeah, um, and Eka bringing up a really good point, which is I expect a tracking plane or two that can peel off if there is a rud, and that is, um, that's a very good point. Which I mean, if you I wonder look, if Hawaii and everyone who lives there can <laughs> peel off as well. <laughs> well, uh, aim well. That's all I can <laughs> say about that. I imagine there's, there's going to have to be Coast Guard assets there to be able to scare boats out of the way. Yeah, oh, yeah, I was going to oh, yeah, say hey, <laughs> some right hash, Carnival cruise ship. <laughs> uh, considering all of the boaters at the crew demo reentry splashdown, <laughs> I'm sure there will be at least patrol boats out and about. So, yeah, yeah, that was that was a bit of a cluster when that happened, wasn't it? So, a bit interesting. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was dangerous unbelievably dangerous um and yeah actually as ek is pointing out which is that space force really 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 wants starship and that's true i've seen them you know do the contractoral studies about point to point uh payload delivery um on earth i mean think how many so, tanks you could put on that thing you take it to the other side of the planet in an yep. hour like yep. seriously I mean, I don't know how you get the tanks down. You need a pretty good lift, but you can get tanks to the other side of the planet a few meters above the ground. Uh, Dan is saying, at what point is it considered an ICBM? So I when they know. put a warhead on top, when it has I, the I, I BS, guess. when it has the the M part. 
<laughs> yeah. Miss song part. <laughs> yeah. Miss song part. Yeah. War hits. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, wow. A lot, a lot coming up on that front um, with that. Um, <laughs> our <laughs> very good one, our avail. <laughs> very nice. So, oh, man. So, very, very cool. Uh, well, well spoken on that there, our avail. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how it goes. So <laughs> Bennett has an even better one. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, you guys, you all crack us up here at the show. This is great. So don't ever change everybody. Y'all are amazing. So, um, so I, should I talk about some things? Y'all want me to talk about some things? Yeah, yeah go for it. Go I mean, for it's it. like astronomy stuff and things like that, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, we have ten, we have ten. No minutes. one talks about astronomy stuff. Talk about astronomy stuff. Jamie's not here, so I I you can, can say whatever you like, yes, and can. you will not get in trouble. Absolutely. Yes. Um, well, Dad's here, so I can't say everything I want to say. Um, but um, actually, Dada, you probably don't care. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with all honesty, because it would be my neck, not yours. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about uh, Lucy. So I, you, I just roll my eyes and say, Ugh, talent. <laughs> Thanks, Dada. That's a good comment here as well. Uh, bring us up to speed on your astrology stuff. Okay, so uh, what's really cool is that, uh, Mike, I don't know if you've noticed, but my hands, I put them in a place where you can't see them because they might be gesturing a certain way. Anyways, <laughs> let's take a look at what I brought up with this here, <laughs> which is the Lucy mission uh, out to see some Trojan asteroids. And I brought this up because over the past couple of, uh, actually, let's go back a little bit to just after the launch of Lucy, you'll probably recall that during their unfurling of the the absolutely massive solar arrays that Lucy uses, uh, that it had a problem with one of them uh, locking into place and getting proper tension on it. But they were able to figure out oh, that it's actually okay to be that way. They're still going to be able to do the science operations with it. Now, uh, they went ahead and they kept trying to do uh, more and more of what they thought could possibly allow Lucy uh, to tighten up uh, and maybe latch that solar uh, array, but they are stopping now because they're uh, starting to go further out from the sun uh, and the spacecraft temperatures are dropping and they don't want to attempt it in, uh, in cooler temperatures um, with that there. So, uh, so this is essentially what Lucy looks like right now. The solar array is not entirely deployed. Um, it is uh, deployed enough, though, that it's still generating about 95% of the expected power, which is well in excess of what Lucy needs to operate. Uh, so minor glitch, um, and uh, they're going to work the problem when Lucy comes back into the solar system uh, in just a little bit. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so continuing on with that. Also, they've got a new target for Lucy. Um, it was already going to be going by a large number of Trojan asteroids. Now it's got a asteroid just in and of itself um, that it's going to go past uh, in November. And what they're going to do, they're actually going to test a system uh, that they're doing, which... Oh, I see all bit. I see all bitty things. Uh, is this going to be complicated or not? Oh, this... Okay, so here's the orbital trajectory for Lucy. Are you ready to see this? I don't know if I'm ready. Okay, is, I'm so, going to hold on. I'm okay. holding on. So this is from the reference point of Jupiter, because the Trojan asteroids are the ones that are at the uh, L4 and L5 positions of Jupiter, if you remember, if if I'm recalling cor my physics correctly um, today uh, with it. If not, somebody will correct me, absolutely, in the chat room. But basically, L4 and Texas. All right, let's take a look here. There's Lucy. <laughs> Flying out. There's the gravitational assist that it just did. It's going to wow. be heading out there. And it, at, at some point around there, it will perform a flyby. Then it goes by the Earth again. Then it does its first flyby. And then it comes out to another Trojan asteroid. And it performs a flyby. And then a flyby. And then a flyby. And then a flyby. Now, oh, holy it hell. <laughs> dives back into the inner solar system. Oh, my God. And zips past the Earth for another gravitational assist <laughs> and goes back out to <laughs> bing, another flyby of a binary 
Trojan asteroid system where they both are like a hundred kilometers across each and they're you know several hundred kilometers away from each other i cannot wait to see that one because that's gonna be absolutely absurd um but what they are doing in this november flyby is so cool they have a uh system is actually going to try to track the asteroid it'll be flying by autonomously uh now most of the time with spacecraft with space missions uh you are basically setting up your cameras to take images with your spacecraft in a best guess as to where the object is going to be. Uh, but in this case, Lucy has special software that they are going to be testing for the first time ever in a mission um, that on approach to this asteroid, it will determine where the asteroid is going in the frame uh, of, the, uh, in, of the instruments and basically track it, auto track it on its way with the so whole it's spacecraft. got michael baylor of nasa space flights rocket auto track on it but for asteroids yes but nobody but uh but it's also really far away and michael baylor is not uh luckily not cold like i think michael would be um with that so yeah that uh but has a good point here which is uh said that i love how most images we see of lucy they now put a broken solar panel in the art yeah well i mean that's <laughs> <laughs> that's very true it's you gonna be to. accurate yeah it's also it's like galileo right galileo had its uh it's sort of uh un uh, unfurled high gain antenna or partially unfurled high gain antenna i should say uh correctly there um yeah same thing so pretty cool uh with that um i also want to talk about this too which was a very big deal um that just happened this week i and see i see an arrow pointing to a <laughs> pixel <laughs> Which must mean it's extremely important. Yes. Um, in fact, uh, the reason we were able to discover this object is because there just so happens to be an arrow-shaped object right next to it um, as it's zipping <laughs> through That's our solar system. That's oddly convenient. It is. So, turns out there's also another one near Pluto, but we're not going to get into that debate. Um, but this is a great image of 2023 BU, which is a asteroid about five meters across, zipped past. Uh, it's not like an online hashtag or something, oh, 2023 no. BU. No, uh, that's just the naming <laughs> conventions. I, you know, I think I explained it in a Tomorrow After Dark once uh, when we were trying to get like an official, actual ast astronomical designation for planet CAF, uh, which 204 is orbiting um, in uh, high super perma geosynchronous orbit. And uh, um, yeah, this is uh, something that was discovered several days before, and it's very notable because it came down all the way to about 3,600 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's... So it's more exciting than the comet. I would say it was more exciting than the comet in terms of the fact that... Because the comet didn't have an arrow. Um, no, so the comet doesn't have an arrow. Uh, and in fact, the comet is still on track to not be visible. Um, so just as I said several... Uh, what was it? Last week? <laughs> Um, or and was the week it, before was it two weeks ago when I got really ranty <laughs> yeah. about, about it and I was like of course you're not going to see it um, because someone in the news media said that you will absolutely be able comet of the century and every time <laughs> someone on the news says that it causes the comet to fizzle out it's just like when you buy new astronomy equipment and you get it all set up to go out and then next thing you know there's like like 18 days straight of rain um, for you to, <laughs> to, to sit at home and admire your new equipment for your telescope. Um, but yeah, so this, this, skirt, this, this skirted past this really, really close, kind of give you an a inbound, outbound trajectory here. Um, holy moly, that was, whew, that was really, really close. Um, I, I, yeah, just skimming over South America there. If it had entered the Earth's atmosphere, nothing bad would have really happened. Would have been a very impressive fireball, um, but don't think it would have even exploded in the Earth's atmosphere with how small it was. But it just goes to show that our sh our solar system is still very much a chaotic place with objects that could hit the Earth. And in fact, this is not the first one that has happened so far this year. There was another object just about two, dun, dun, two weeks dun. ago. So that also did that, another asteroid about five meters across, that was also just as close, but that one wasn't reported on like this one was, um, because uh -huh. this one was discovered a couple days ahead of time. 
And this one, 2023 BU, a couple days ahead of time. The one that skimmed us two weeks ago, 2023 AV, another, again, very well named. That one that's was not just, as good as that's a that's not as good as a hashtag though. So quite. I don't like that one as much. Um, 2023 so, BU is more inspiring, you know. That works really well on Twitter. Yeah, definitely. Um, and mm. um, what was uh, so interesting about 2023 AV is that it was caught outbound. So. We didn't see it coming. We missed. We missed the train. It had already left. We caught it the day. We caught it about twenty six hours after its closest approach to the Earth. So, um, yeah, Please. Smokey is saying, um, uh, <laughs> uh, solar system is chaotic and lawless. And then <laughs> Rat King in the chat there is this a parabola? So possibly. Um, possibly with that there. Oh man, that absolutely cracks me up. And now it's aiming for Hawaii. Yes, now it is. So, <laughs> um, yeah, really, really funny stuff. Um, so I got two more to go. Two more to go. I pro two more okay, to go. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so one one is the Nancy. Uh, this is a great image. The Nancy this Grace. A, sorry, Nancy I'm, I'm spoiling it for all of the viewers. Go on, go on, go on. <laughs> so the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope uh, is uh, finally coming together. They finally started building it, um, and that's the one that has the mirror donated from the NRO um, which if we'd like to take a look at that mirror um, let's take a look at some of these really great images <laughs> it's just uh, that we have for it. Redact of the mirror redacted yeah uh, so it's a 2.4 meter it's so, mirror it's so shiny it absorbs all light yes <laughs> and it just so happens um, that it's so curved uh, that it also turns that light into a square so who knew that <laughs> um but um that mirror is basically a 2.4 meter mirror for a hubble that looks back at the earth um and you know they got two of them um and and the nro basically said here take these but just don't aim them at the earth please <laughs> <laughs> which i love that which and, by and the way promise. i was just being funny there there are actual images of the of the 2.4 meter mirror for the nancy grace <laughs> roman telescope and it is an absolutely fantastic instrument special thanks and whatever you do don't point it back at the uh yes so you'll notice that in every image it is pointed up away from the earth so nasa <laughs> is listening to what the national reconnaissance office told them so um it is it is going to be a fantastic uh fantastic instrument and i can't wait for the space telescope in the late 2020s uh to get up there to essentially replace hubble and get a little bit better than hubble um the thing about what it could do hubble uh did a survey of the andromeda galaxy where it took in excess of 120 images um, to take uh, a full photo, if you will, to stitch together of the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, Nancy Grace Roman here, the field of view is so wide, but it's still so sharp. Uh, it would only take two images for it to do the exact same thing that it took in excess of 100 for Hubble to do. Um, so, holy moly, um, that I cannot yeah, wait. Yeah, some pretty pictures. I cannot wait. Yeah, some more pretty pictures um, with that there. And then uh, for my final one here, I'm running through this um, really, really fast. Oh, so there's something here uh, that I'm being alerted to. Um, oh, oh yeah, I had heard about that. We had a, a close call in orbit today, right? So, yep. very close I call. That way. Well, I just put the Twitter in the... In I put the Twitter linky in the in the linkiness. Yeah, why don't you why don't you t speak to it a little bit? So two ex Soviet uh, ex Soviet. When did they launch? I don't know when they <laughs> launched. And maybe ex either ex Soviet or ex Russia from that part of the world. Well, it wasn't Russia a thing in the Soviet Union. Anyways, you know what I'm talking about. So two defunct satellites passed within uh, a an estimated six meters of each other with an error margin in the tens so make of that what you will they were either six meters apart or much more than six meters apart but still very 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 close to, very much too close for comfort even with those error bars and if you scroll down a bit you can see jonathan mcdowell did a wonderful google earth uh, visualization thing as he always does and also a size comparison 
of the telescope, not telescopes, of the defunct satellites, if they actually... Whoa! <laughs> if they were actually <sighs> six metres apart, that is what it would have looked like, and oh. the trajectories that they were going as well, which is just, you know... Yeah, this is, an, this is a <sighs> reason why being able to deorbit defunct satellites is a fantastic idea, because the <sighs> this... If these collided... Wow. So, you know, space debris, little fragments flying everywhere. Not a not a good day. No, and also they're in perfect. Uh, they're in polar orbits too, two two separate polar orbits. So you'd basically have these two rings, these uh, offset by ninety degrees that you would have to go through potentially with the debris. Yeah. So wow, Hold, I mean, just mm -hmm. like thinking about this distance like looking at this helps really visualize the fact and also this is eight kilometers per second wow <laughs> six <laughs> yeah. meters wow i mean blinking you miss it seriously oh man that is you know i i yeah that's wild holy smokes Thank God we that Ragozin still isn't in charge of Roscosmos anymore because we would have got to tweet something along the lines of our fantastic Soviet technology managed to precisely make two satellites come very close to each other but not collide and they were six meters apart and this is fantastic and we didn't launch them on broomsticks and something something. Yeah, something something or the other. So, um, all right. So final thing I'm going to talk about, which I want to just uh, let our tomorrow viewers know about, which is that there is a lunar occultation of Mars coming up on Monday. Uh, this is from uh, Griffith Observatory. Thanks for the media uh, showing us how that's going to go forward. And uh, we'll see if I can get it to react to me here. And it's not. Um, so I'm going to have to scroll through it yeah, manually here. Yeah, it does appear to it does appear to have frozen for me here. Um, so Dada, if you want to bring it back to me, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's not frozen; it's just a ton of frames. I'm sorry about that. Uh, well, we all know how uh, uh, Apple does uh, with, with <laughs> gifs or gifs or gifs, uh, whatever Gaius. you want to call them. So gifs, yes, gifs. Um, and as you could see here at 8 p.m. Pacific. It, Pacific time, it will uh, be very close to the moon, and then at eight thirty-six p.m. Pacific time is when it will touch the moon. It will begin to go behind the moon, and then it will reappear fifty-four minutes later at nine thirty p.m. Pacific time, and then at ten o'clock, we will wrap that up. And if you want to, YouTube.com/slash Griffith Observatory, we will be covering it live. Don't come up to the observatory itself uh, because we'll be closed. And then here is the area that you can see it. Uh, as you can see, uh, you've got to be in a very... Once again, Europe left out. I can't see anything. Eclipses, ocular, whatever you said. I can't see <laughs> nothing. It's boring. <laughs> Honestly, we get absolutely nothing. Um, it's ridiculous. Okay. That's the last time I we... Hate, I hate physics. That's the last time we bring a rocket to England for you to watch. <laughs> and I didn't get to see it anyway, because it was on a plane that flew out to Ireland. <laughs> All right, so this is the rotation of Mars. Here's the visibility <laughs> map. Uh, if you're in with the, where the blue and the red are intermixed with each other, that means you'll be able to see the whole thing. The red is you'll be able to see it up to the disappearance, the blue up to the reappearance of Mars. Uh, and as you can see, uh, all of Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica, and some other countries as well are going to be able to get a view of it. But it will really just be the southeastern, south central, and southwestern United States. Uh, even here in California, San Francisco isn't going to get it. But here in L.A., we're going to get it. So, uh, yeah. So if you're Isn't in that just down the road, though? Like, yeah. It, it, like, thinking about scale, you know? Yeah. Just like how we talked about how, like, it's, what is it, longer than your country i think right from tip to tip something like that we measured something it, like that and we were like yeah. ah it's no big deal or at least for us we were like mm. ah it's no big deal like we've driven that a hundred yeah. times so yeah, yeah. anyways that's it. That's all I got to say. Little little lightning round to end the show with uh, today as yeah. we go a little bit over, but that's okay. You all are probably not worried about yeah. it. Uh, and if you like what we do, you should become a member. Go to youtube.com slash quickly, 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 yeah. quickly, 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 quickly. Two Ryan. comments. One from the launch pad. Uh, you can put it back up. Uh, how many meters between Jared and Dutta? I don't know. And uh, Aravail are... replies. Uh, six plus or minus tens. <laughs> Actually, I think we might be 
uh, no joke, about six meters apart right now. What do you think, Dada? Now just, now just run at eight kilometers per second. We can have a very accurate visualization of what happens <laughs> what, just about Antarctica. What's, what's a meter? Two, two point eight feet. Uh, wow. Someone in a in Europe has to look it up. Let me, let me. Uh, uh, Am I going to beat you with the freedom units here? It's five point six one eight bananas, apparently. So. Three three point two foot. So, yeah, we're probably five to six meters. Yeah, thereabouts. So, wow, this really puts it into perspective. Just out close. High five. Oh, that was my arm that just popped. Good stuff. I'm going to go to the hospital now. Um, anyways. Hey, now you thank the members. I'll look for the comment of the show. Okay. All right. So to our members, I want to thank you all. We're going to be starting with Club 33 Plaid Pro Plus. It's This is really difficult to do. It's okay. Dada, where did, where did we actually end up going to start with? <laughs> I, I, they're on the I started, they're on thirty three plus. I started okay. I started with one. Okay, because I'm still. But yeah, you, you, you you do you, and I'll just follow along. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Neurostream. We appreciate you being a tomorrow model thirty three plaid pro plus edition member. Um, we also have our escape velocity members, um, and. Uh, these folks have access to our escape velocity channel in our discord which by the way you could join our discord as it is feel free to come on in we're uh, we're a rather humorous bunch but we're even funnier in escape velocity um i feel that at least we are because we go a little off the off the leash a little bit sometimes um in there so it's a pretty it's a pretty fun place to be you think the shows are off the rails yeah let me tell you <laughs> um also we sometimes will um Joel, uh, yeah. Anyways, um, we also have our orbital members. Uh, we, why can my brain not work today? <laughs> oh my gosh! Come on, brain, brain, you can do it. These are our orbital members. So glad to have you all with us. And of course, if you'd like to be a, uh, become a member, you can head over to YouTube.com/tmro/join. We've also got our suborbital members as well, uh, or they may be our parabolic members, for all we know. Um, <laughs> that, bringing up a little bit of They're a debate. They're our Starship Orbital Flight Test members. Yes. Um, also, our ground support members, who are uh, the ones that are going to hopefully not get blown up in our 33 engine static fire test. <laughs> um, with that there. Uh, so, thank you so much for what you got. We also have our system support members, uh, and every little bit helps. It's literally as little as 99 cents a month. And you're in. You're a member, and you get to join the members-only stream, which is where myself and Ryan and a fresh, finally here Dutta are going to go as soon as we're done looking at the comment of there the we week. Go. All right, are we, you ready for really it? I see it. Okay, the comment of the week is... Here it comes. Now, now we wait for the thing to load. <laughs> which, what is it? Who knew that energetic <laughs> propellants are energetic chemicals from Robin? Congratulations, Excellent. you win nothing. You are immortalized in physical form for the next uh, however many days it takes before Jamie does a Twitch stream and uses the vest for it <laughs> again. Um, or I'm back in, or we're back in here for the show next week. So congratulations, uh, Robin, you've done it. Um, excellent and we're now going to head over to our members only stream uh, so I just realized I have to do that so give me a minute yeah so we're going to uh, I forgot I have to do that we should get fractional I like what Eka says here which is fractional orbit members um, I like that one um, Jared trying to brain cell yeah it's it's been tough um, it's let me tell you it it's is hard. really I, uh, it's tough here the steam is rising really really hard anyways that's it for this week's show thank you all so much we'll see you next week I'll be here next week what about you Ryan I'll be here next week excellent what about you Dada uh, I, I think so okay excellent uh, see y'all later let's, let's do this yeah. bye bye yeah look at Mars it's gonna be cool <laughs>